I'm James Turk. I'm a director of the Gold Money Foundation. It's my pleasure to be here today with John Brimlow. John's uh, an old friend of mine. Uh, he's probably been involved in the gold market just about as long as I have, uh, 30 plus years, and we'll leave it at that. Horrible. John runs a service called Gold Jottings, which is uh, used by institutional investors all around the world. I find it a very valuable service because what he does is he looks at gold premiums, in other words, the physical side of the market rather than the paper side, and makes conclusions about whether the gold market is, is tight or whether the gold market is a little bit loose at any moment in time. John, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. Honored to be here. Tell, tell me a little bit about Gold Jottings um, and you know goldjottings.com, your website. Um, you look at premiums everywhere in the world, or are I look at them every, every major market where I can find a real price. This is a function of the internet. Um, years ago, we just heard rumors that the souk was a buyer or the Indians weren't a buyer. Uh, the writers used to carry stories about whether India was or wasn't a buyer, but in general, these turned out to be quite dishonest. So they eventually abandoned that. However, with the internet, uh, you can actually uh, take a price from a certain country at a specific time in the day and therefore convert it through its foreign exchange rate and work out what the dollar price is. Uh, if the dollar price is high enough to warrant importing and uh, covering uh, transshipment costs and any duties there might be, then that country's a buyer. And when it isn't, it isn't. Uh, and it cuts through a lot of uh, nonsense and a lot of prevarication. It's also very quick. Uh, the really key market in the gold physical trade is India. India is perfectly capable of turning on a dime. It can go from being emphatically not an importer to emphatically a huge importer in a matter of a few days. It takes quite a lot of time for that to trickle through to most gold observers. Uh, I might also say that more, more, the people best in a position to judge this are of course are the bullion bankers who are inhibited from saying that because their customers don't like their activities being disclosed or the virtues of being independent. Yeah. What causes the premiums uh, to go up and, and go down? Is it just merely a change in price, or is there some other factor that uh, comes into play as well? Uh, so, uh, in essence, the world gold price, i.e. the US dollar gold price, is the, is the starting point. But of course, the foreign exchange rate of the particular country is very critical. This is what happened in the first quarter of 2009, after the big financial crash. Um, uh, foreign exchange rates in the Asian countries uh, collapsed. And the consequence of this was that even though the gold price had gone up somewhat in dollars, in Asian currency terms it had gone on up enormously. Uh, and the Asian uh, fellows responded to this by selling into the price. Mm -hmm. So in early 2009, when there were plenty of stories of Americans and Europeans buying vast quantities of gold, which were true, and the gold price was going up in a very satisfactory way. Unfortunately, Asia was a huge seller. Uh, on a scale, in fact, that hasn't been seen in a generation. The interesting thing about the current run, in particular this morning, is that the Asians have not backed out of the market. Some of the markets are at discounts, but they're not at the huge discounts that would warrant the collection and, and um, processing and shipping of gold overseas. This means that the gold market is in much healthier shape than it was back there in January, February 2009. Yeah. You know, this is one of the things that I find invaluable about your service. And it also shows the way the nature of the market has changed over the past 10 years. Because, you know, previously when gold was under $1,000 an ounce, those Asian buyers would wait for a 20 or 30 percent correction before, you know, it'd go back into premiums. Um, and this time around, when it went over $1,000, uh, they're not necessarily waiting for those pullbacks. It seems like no. those, um, uh, those import levels are you know, following the gold price up pretty much. I think uh, internet works both ways, of course, and the Indians and uh, the Chinese are perfectly capable of reading about the American financial system and making deductions about what this means for American appetite and European appetite for gold. But the amazing thing about this particular situation in July, August 2011 is that this is traditionally the, the time of the year when the Asian physical demand is soft. Uh, there's, in India, they're getting rained on, and uh, it, it seems to be that China is a function, it, it focuses on the Lunar New Year. So in essence, the, the strong part of the gold market, uh, based purely on the Asian appetite, is for Q4 and Q1 of a given year. And uh, June through August um, it can be quite slack. 
this has just not been the case this time. First of all, the gold price, of course, has performed. But secondly, the Asians have, by and large, followed fall the world gold price up, which I find quite surprising. Yeah. Have you seen this before that you can recall, where you've seen this kind of strong demand in an off-season no, time of the year? Nothing this intense. If you go back to 1999, when the central banks were doing their best to destroy the gold market, the Indians bought prodigious amounts of gold in the midsummer of 1999. Um, and they also did in the midsummer of 2007. So if the price goes down enough, they act. Mm -hmm. But uh, they're very judicious about their price uh, judgments. And um, this is really quite a surprise.